Hey, it is my pleasure uh, to welcome Morris Berman, who is a, a prominent cultural historian, social critic, and author of a trilogy of books about the decline of America's empire, including its final installment, Why America Failed, which was just released earlier this year in paperback. He's also written other compelling works, such as his personal and philosophical memoir, Spinning Straw into Gold, and the forthcoming cultural analysis of Japan called Neurotic Beauty, An Outsider Looks at Japan, which is due to be released this December. Welcome to the Soapbox, Morris Berman. Thanks so much, Eric. I really appreciate it. All right, so let me, um, let me just start with this, Morris. Is America a failed state? Yeah, I mean, that was the title of that, you know, book you mentioned, Why America Failed. Uh, I don't see it as a uh, roaring success, and one wonders if it ever was, except in a material sense. Um, It's, you know, it's an interesting thing. Um, In 1978, Irving Kristol wrote a book called Two Cheers for Capitalism, in which he said, well, the first cheer is that capitalism is the fastest way of accumulating wealth. Um, my comment would be wealth for whom, but let's let that slide for a moment. Mm-hmm. The second uh, cheer would be that it provides for a great deal of personal uh, political liberty. And again, I think that, that there could be a debate about that subject, but okay. But the third thing, he said, it only gets two cheers. It doesn't get three, because the third cheer would be that it satisfies human existential needs, that that's what really a society is about. And on this score, he said, capitalism really fails. And so the things that uh, we might expect from a society um, are that it provides meaning and purpose to the lives of its citizens. Um, It protects family life, community. People are proud of their work and interested in it. it's a it's a craft pride that they have in it. Um, there's a whole list of of things that would be psychological and existential and so on. And he said, on this score, capitalism does not deliver the goods. Well, the so it depends on to answer that question it depends on where what your you know process of evaluation is. But uh, the thing I would say is that. Um, the, the United States being the, the leading, the cutting edge of the whole neoliberal, extractive, corporate, consumer, <laughs> et cetera, uh, way of life, um, has not delivered the goods except in a material sense, and then it's a question of you know, who got most of the pie. But um, I think um, the historian Mark Bloch, a medieval uh, French historian of the uh, Middle Ages, said that any society should be judged on whether it makes most of its members happy. And um, I would say that most Americans today are bitter and resentful and depressed. Uh, and that, uh, in that sense, America failed. And the book I wrote, Why America Failed, was the attempt to analyze uh, what had happened. So one of the things you point to was is that there was a consumption and uh, a greed or an elevation of consumption and greed and avarice that you're saying has been a toxic element of our national character right from the very founding of our country. Can you explain that? Well, that's the interesting thing. It's a question of that that gets down to the root of what one means by success. What I do in uh, Why America Failed is talk about from the late 16th century how uh, those who were present on the North American continent uh, were largely uh, traders and trappers and basically real estate brokers in a certain sense. Uh, excuse me, but people who had come looking for fortune. And it was, I think, Lewis Hartz in um, the Liberal Tradition in America. This is 1955. I think it was Hartz who said that. There is such a thing as a fragment society, and a fragment society is when a nation breaks off from the mother country, a colony breaks off from you know the mother country. <coughs> Excuse me. And what happens is that it takes uh, a fragment of that country's constellation of values, and it makes that fragment its entire value. 
And this is what happened when uh, England, uh, when the United States of America broke off from England, it essentially, the value that it took was that of the British entrepreneurial middle class, uh, you know, what C.B. McPherson called the, the theory of possessive individualism. It took the whole theory of possessive individualism. And that became the, the mainstay, the dominating factor in our culture. It didn't take Shakespeare. It wasn't interesting. Well, it was, but, you know, not, you know, only, only to sort of have as a book on your bedside. It didn't take it as a working value. Let's say Shakespeare is a working value. And so with, with the mother country, you have a whole constellation of values. With the colony, and if it's a fragment society, what happens is it just emphasizes one thing. And that's what we did. And the result is that um, the, expand, the economic expansion of the United States was dramatic, and um, I think between 1776 and 18, by 1876, 100 years into the founding of the United States, it was manufacturing one third of the world's goods. That's pretty impressive, you know. Mm-hmm. But it's it, what's what lies the shadow. What lies underneath that is uh, all the things that got lost, you know. Uh, that um, uh, you know, Crystal points out is the thing that capitalism doesn't deliver, and in fact, I think makes people suffer on that level. So the the whole premise that life is about an expanding economy, uh, that the American dream is that there are no limits to what you could have geographically, technologically, economically, and personally in your life, um, that was a a grave error and. The dialectic has come around now where what enabled us to expand materially is now killing us on the emotional and spiritual level. And that's why the United States is becoming unraveled. Um, finally, uh, that's, a fragment society is too thin a thread to base an entire way of life on. And is this what you mean uh, by this idea of America's hustling culture this, this idea yeah, that, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I mean, I was going to say that, um, you know, the real answer to the question, why did America fail, is that there were alternative voices mm. from a very early period, from, let's say, Captain John Smith in 1616. There were alternative voices that said, uh, this direction is a mistake. And that included the Puritan divines and... Um, Emerson and Thoreau, and then later on, Vance Packard and Lewis Mumford and Jane Jacobs and John Kenneth Galbraith, and finally Jimmy Carter. That was 1979, his spiritual Malay speech, as it was called. He didn't actually use that phrase, but that speech he gave in Annapolis in July of 1979, that was the defining moment of the end of any possible hope for um, the country having a different basis than the dominant culture, which was the derivative from that fragment society. And so um, there, you know, the, all these people that I mentioned are, are regarded as quaint in a certain sense. Who reads Lewis Mumford today, you know? Um, and yet, recently, I was rereading some of his work. Somebody asked me to actually write an article, a, a short bio of, um, of uh, Mumford for a magazine, it was very interesting to reread this stuff from like the '60s and '70s, and um, and even before, and it took my breath away how sane the man was. You know, mm. I mean, so he's regarded as quaint, he's marginalized, he's outside. You know, well, so is Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter is regarded as a bad president, but if you you know he, he flubbed the whole thing, it was a mess, and so on. And uh, I don't think so. I mean, it's not not my view of what Carter was about. But Ronald Reagan, who supplanted Carter, uh, is generally comes out number one on polls of who's your favorite president, and that says that says precisely where the American value system is. Uh, they, you know, Americans never got over the American dream, even though, to quote the title of a book of a few years ago, the American dream is killing us. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's. Go back to that uh, Carter speech, the the spiritual malaise speech, because it's really a remarkable speech, and, and people can find it on YouTube, and I encourage them to do so. Um, 
And it struck me as a moment of real blunt honesty from one of our, uh, well, the most prominent national leader in the country. And it wasn't just honesty, but he was asking for sacrifice from citizens. Um, And can you sort of describe that speech and describe what you feel Carter was trying to do and how it how and why it didn't resonate with, well, it resonated, but not in the way that Carter was, was hoping for, uh, and how that set the stage for Reagan to come down the line. Yeah, well, you know, during the, the campaign, the presidential election campaign in 1980, uh, Reagan said that Carter was out of touch with where most Americans were at. And the truth is, he was right. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was absolutely right about that, and that he himself was in touch with what most Americans were about, which was hustling. The 70s, in a certain sense, were uh, kind of illusory, because what happened after you know the, the, the collapse of the 60s movement and so on was uh, that a lot of that energy got diverted into an environmental movement. And if you look at the books published during that decade, one after another, I mean, Wendell Berry and Amory Lovins and Paul Ehrlich, and uh, of course, the centerpiece of it all, the whole Earth Catalog. I mean, everybody, you know, uh, polls that were taken showed that Americans wanted a simpler lifestyle. They were interested in voluntary simplicity, uh, back to the land movement, all this sort of thing. But when push came to shove, and it was a question of actually doing it, all of that got blown away like dandelion spores. <laughs> Americans weren't serious about that. And these books were bestsellers. I mean, they sold in the millions of copies. It didn't amount to anything. It, you can't make a political movement out of bestsellers. And, and the whole earth catalog is not going to you know, overturn capitalism. So the, the, um, the, the thing, that I think Carter really misjudged the audience. At the same time, he was a Southern preacher. I mean, he did have that in his, you know, blood or whatever. And he wanted to say to the American people, your lives are stupid and superficial. Um, you think that you can fill the emptiness in your lives by buying another television set? Think again. And he wanted, to, he wanted the American people to be a different people than they were. And that wasn't going to fly because... All of that cocktail party stuff that was going on in the 70s was just that. It was just cocktail party stuff. And so it it wasn't going to fly. And the day after the speech, I always found this wonderful in a horrifying sense. Uh, The day after the speech, several congressmen took to the floor of Congress to say that they actually thought that the president had gone insane, not as a metaphor but that he was literally out of his mind. And so the attempt to say you ought to have deeper values than the next television set or washing machine, that was considered insane. The, also the speech said, you know, there are limits to how far we can blame the Soviet Union or any external enemy. And very much unlike you know, somebody like Reagan or Bush, which is a kind of false and fundamental Christianity, um, Carter was a true Christian. He said, uh, you know, it's a more, more important is the mode in your eye than the, than the speck, the, the beam in your, the, you know, the beam in your eye than the speck, the moat in the eye of the other person. It, excuse me. And we have to start looking at ourselves and what we ourselves do, uh, you know, are doing. Now, you know, that, that's something that in my work I've tried to develop and talk over, about over and over again, that we do get the, the leaders and, and the regime that we deserve. It's not like uh, they are imposing something on us. I have, I think there are very de- definite limits. I agree partly, but I think there are very definite limits to Noam Chomsky's argument about the manufacture of consent. Mm. It, it is partly true, but it's also the case that 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 is what the American, who the American people are, and this is what they want. And you know, um, I know of only one uh, historian in studying the Roman Empire. Uh, it wasn't really an historian. I'm talking about Lewis Mumford again. He wrote a book called The Human Condition in 1944. And he said, you know, the Roman people were really interested themselves in pillage and pilfer. 
those are that was his phrase. Well, I call it hustling. But he said that's what they were really interested in. If we want to look at the sources of the collapse of the Roman Empire, you have to talk about who those people are, not just you know the campaign with the Visigoths or whatever. And I know of no other writer or historian who has said, ah, that's you see the problem was the Roman people. I feel sometimes like I'm in a. I mean, I'm far below the talent of. Lewis Mumford, but I feel I'm in a similar position because I've talked a lot about that audience that was listening to Jimmy Carter mm-hmm. uh, when he was saying, um, you're, you're, you're shallow, you're a collection of shallow people, and you have to turn turn your lives around now. And and the result was scorn, and that scorn signed our death warrant. Hmm. Now, so, so we had Reagan, and you can have everything you want, and good morning America, and look at the result. Look at the result. We're now on the rocks. Mm. I wonder um, what you would say of sort of the sweeping and desperate national mandate for change that happened in 2008 with with President Barack Obama, which, of course, he promptly abandoned. Um, But isn't that an example of the the electorate, the, the citizenry sort of crying out desperately for a, a dramatic change in direction? Well, um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good question. It's a question of what that type of change, that mandate, was about. Um, you know, my feeling is that what Americans want, they want to change without changing. Mm. And that that 2008 election was essentially anti-Bush. It wasn't pro-Obama. Nobody even knew who Obama was. And it turned out, after 12 years of being a law professor, he didn't publish a single page, that he was always a friend of the rich. Uh, that, I mean, the, the, the person he turned into is the person that he really was. And, and uh, one, one way to, to, to say that is that he's empty. He's a really empty person. He had, uh, has no idea who he is or what he's doing. And that's showing up almost on a daily basis. I mean, every time he opens his mouth, it's like you just want to scratch your head and and say, hey, you got to be kidding. And this is on both sides of the aisle. You know, I mean, who is this guy? You know, But the thing is that that election, that mandate for change, I mean, all he did during that election was run around with these signs he had printed up saying hope and change. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I mean, she's not a favorite of mine <laughs> politically, uh, Sarah Palin, but I remember when she once said, how's that hopey changey thing working for you? You know, it was nothing. It was just words. And she understood it and so do a lot of other people. It's just talk. So I think that that mandate for change was actually a mandate for God's sakes. Let's get let's get rid of Bush. You know, I mean, we can't take this anymore. And that was his his essential campaign platform. Mm-hmm. So the 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 thing is that um, uh, the changes that Americans really want are cosmetic. Hmm. Gore Vidal said it years ago. He said, if you want to understand American politics, it's just that it consists of one one party with two right wings. From the outside, you know, from the inside of the United States, we have these debates on TV when it comes to election time. And, it, boy, it looks impressive. The two sides are duking it out, you know. But the political differences between those two sides, seen from the outside of the United States, are laughably small. Um the the Canadian writer and political person, uh, who am I thinking of? Michael, oh, he wrote the biography of Isaiah Berlin. I can't remember at this moment, it slipped my mind. But he, he made a very good comment. He said, in the United States, the choice is between empire and empire light. So with the GOP, we've got empire. And with Democrats, we've got empire light. And now with Obama, we've actually got empire heavy. And the next president presumably Hillary Clinton, is empire all the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, um, you know, so everybody's going to get excited. Oh, the traveling pantsuit, and we've got a woman in the White House, and so on. It's same old, same old. What we have is a Bush-Obama-Hillary Clinton presidency in a continuous line. Hmm. So um, you've you've mentioned that uh, you don't see that much of a difference between or, or the difference between Wall Street and Main Street isn't as great as we might like to think. And, and sort of to this point of um, 
people becoming frustrated and uh, resentful and depressed. Do you see episodes such as the Occupy movement, the protests that arose in Ferguson, the Locavore movement? And, you know, are these uh, sort of symptomatic of this sort of bitterness and resentment that is inherent in American people? I mean, obviously, these are justifiable causes, or do they represent a citizenry that is really becoming legitimately fed up and wanting to overthrow the system and supplant it with something more egalitarian and more equitable? Well, locavore, you know, this is a really good question. And locavore is an interesting thing because that would change, um, you know, transport and trade arrangements uh, to, to basically have all your food come from within, what, 100 miles or something like that, that already is moving in an ecological direction. And I think that there, there are certain, you know, attempts um, to uh, dump uh, the whole American dream capitalist expansion thing and say we really want a different way of life. Um, and so, you know, I mean, we could talk about alternate currency systems, alternate energy systems and so on that are going on much more in Europe than in the United States, but there are some, there are some things here and, and they've been written about. Um, Occupy and Ferguson are a different thing. They fall within, within the category. I mean, I could be wrong about this, but I never saw uh, online, even in favorable write-ups of the Occupy movement. I didn't go to Zuccotti Park, but I, you know, paying attention online, I never saw a statement uh, from the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, that uh, outright rejected the American dream. What I saw was a constant hammering on the theme of 1% versus 99%. In other words, it's a socialist argument. Um, there's an unfair distribution of wealth. Uh, most people are getting screwed. We need to redistribute that wealth. Uh, the upper 1% uh, have us by the throat. That's why we're down at Wall Street. That's who, the, who represents the upper. They are the upper 1% and so on. But I never saw anything. I mean, it shows you the difference between something like the student movement of the 60s and, and of today that in 1962, the SDS published the Port Huron Statement. I would encourage any listener to download that and from the net and read it. It was mostly written, I think, by Tom Hayden. But it's quite remarkable, a statement of the analysis of what's gone wrong with the United States, what we have to address, and so on. Sophisticated, you know, structural, analytical, that kind of thing. Occupy didn't have any of that. At the time of that movement, I wrote an essay on my blog called Energy Versus Analysis, and I said, you know, it's high on energy, but it's pretty low on analysis. Um, all it's really got, I mean, you know, if, if it had said, reject the American dream, there, there are limitations to this, that would have been a whole different ballgame. But most of the types of things, like when Howie Zinn writes a book about, you know, people's America and the people's history of the United States and so on, he's talking about people, you know, women, black people, people who are excluded, that are knocking on the door to get inside the American dream. And uh, Ferguson represents that as well, as far as I can see. There's a, a severe racial injustice, and we want a better deal. We want to be treated like anybody else. It's, it's knocking on the door to get into the American dream. But, you know, the, the, I don't see uh, many people saying, yeah, but the whole American dream is the problem. <laughs> Growth is the problem, not the solution. Um, reportedly, Martin Luther King shortly before he was assassinated, said to Harry Belafonte that sometimes he had the feeling that he was hurrying people into a church that was burning down. Now, that's a remarkable kind of insight, hmm. because what he was saying is, I'm trying to get black people into the Church of the American Dream, but meanwhile, that church is on flames. It's like, you know, it's like saying... Uh, one, one type of politics, which I think OWS represented, was uh, more people need a larger share of the pie. But there's a very different type of politics that I don't notice in any of their you know, online statements or anything else that said the whole pie is rotten. Who wants a larger share of a rotten pie? Well, once you, you do that, and that's why, to me, socialism is just the flip side of capitalism. Once you do that, you're in a different ballgame. You're criticizing the United States at a very fundamental level, 
And what what one wonders what would have happened if MLK had not been assassinated and had continued down the road of linking foreign and domestic politics, which is what he was doing, mm-hmm. and uh, you know the uprising, the the um, war in Vietnam with the garbage strike in New York, and striking workers, and the fact that there was something wrong with the whole system. Why fight to get into a system that is sick? So we'll never know. You know, that puts me in mind of a movie that recently came out called Snowpiercer. I'm not sure if you've seen it. Um, have you seen Great it? Great title. <laughs> yeah, it's it's basically a Marxist allegory, and it, it it's a train. Uh, I won't go too, too into this, but it's a train, and uh, there's an insurrection. All the, the working class, the lower class people are stuck in the back of the train, and then the closer to the front of the train, the nicer... Um, nicer it is, and and they're but they're all confined on the train. This is like post-apocalyptic. The world is frozen over, and there's this train that's perpetually going around the planet, and the, all of the survivors of mankind are on this train, and so they mount this revolution. And um, I boy, I guess if anyone wants to watch this and be surprised, tune out. There's a little bit of a spoiler, but it gets to the uh, to the part where the person leading this revolution is faced with the possibility of uh, of of basically supplanting the leader and one of the the other characters basically says no we need to destroy the train we need to get off the train <laughs> yeah actually nathaniel hawthorne had a story around 1860 something like that i can't remember the train to hell or something <laughs> he did there's a story that he has a certain similarity to that mm. It's a great movie. I I, I know that uh, from from reading your books that you enjoy good film, and and I would check that out if if uh, if you like it. Um, so, uh, did you have something to say? Yeah, I just wanted to first ask you to repeat it for our listeners. What's the title? The title is Snowpiercer, and I apologize. I I don't know the name of the director. Um, Snowpiercer. Okay. Yeah. The <laughs> excuse me. I also wanted to recommend another film that I find very powerful. I think it's 2013 called The East, which is about eco-terrorism. And uh, it's uh, also a very powerful film raising the question of um, if you're going to save the planet, how do you do it? Uh, and what are, what's, what's at stake? You know, what are the paths to take and, and what's at stake? And uh, uh, it's really a remarkable film on a number of levels. It's called The East. 